So with the Days of Future Past film coming out, I figured it'd be an extremely good idea to do a video on this topic um, because I think that there are a lot of people who have a lot of questions about the original storyline and how close the movie will be with the original storyline, but also because I think that people are fascinated by the idea of alternate universes and are fascinated by the idea of the depiction of some of their favorite Marvel characters in alternate universes. And with the Days of Future Past comic being one of the most popular and kind of the forerunner to the alternate universe concept in Marvel Comics, this really seems to be the best time to do a discussion on this type of thing, and particularly about the Days of Future Past storyline itself. So before we get too far into our discussion about the Days of Future Past comic, there are a couple dates that I would like for you to keep in mind. The first date is 2013, and the second date is 1980. And the reason why these dates are important is because the comic will pick up in 2013, and then it'll transition to 1980, and then it will bounce back and forth between the two dates as events unfold in their respective timelines. So the comic starts with Kitty Pride heading to some unknown destination in New York to meet with Wolverine. Along the way we learn a few things, and what we learn is that this future is very dystopian and it's very dark. New York has been left in a state of decay, and whatever event it was that led up to New York being this way has also affected both Canada and the United States itself and possibly the world. In addition, once Kitty Pride meets with uh, Wolverine, we also learn that Wolverine is part of a group called the Canadian Resistance Army. He is also supplying Kitty Pride with a piece of, uh, of a device of some sort in order to complete what is referred to as the Jammer. Now, we don't really know what the Jammer does or what it's for, but we do know that it's important enough that Kitty Pride was willing to brave these outskirts, these uh, derelict parts of New York outside of the safe zones, in order to meet with Wolverine to attain it. We also learn from Wolverine that Phase 2 of whatever plan it is that they have created will begin at midnight. But again, we don't really know what this is, and we don't know what Phase 1 means. From this point, Kitty Pride heads back to her place of origin, that is to say, the place that she originally left to meet with Wolverine. Along the way, we learn a few things about the structure of society at this point in time. And what we learn is that there are three casts of people. There are humans, and these are baseline people. These are individuals that have no potential for uh, genetic mutation. These individuals are allowed to breed. Now, we're not really given any other information regarding these individuals. We don't know if they're allowed to hold political office, and we don't even know if there are political offices anymore. The next group are anomalous humans, and these are humans that have the potential for genetic mutation, however these genes have not become active. These individuals are not allowed to breed, but we're not really told whether or not they have the same rights as humans, or if their rights are restricted to some degree, aside from being unable to uh, procreate. The next group, and the final and last and, and most despised group in this society, are mutants. And mutants are either exterminated on sight, or they are rounded up and placed into internment camps where they simply await termination at some future point in time. Eventually, Kitty Pride reaches the internment camp in the Bronx, where she has been interred for about 13 years or so, maybe 14 years. And after going through an exhaustive and, and as she explains it, a humiliating um, examination process, she makes her way through the cemetery, which is the first thing that you see as you enter the internment camp. Now, this is a very iconic comic book panel in comic books. And the reason why is because this confirms that almost all of the comic book characters in Marvel that we have come to know and love have been killed. Susan Storm, Johnny Storm, Cyclops, Jean Grey, uh, Nightcrawler. All these characters are dead. Now, Kitty Pride uh, continues to explain to us that in this time, of the original X-Men, there are only four that remain. There are Wolverine, Storm, Colossus, and Kitty Pride herself. In addition, we also learn that Wolverine is alive, I'm sorry, that uh, Magneto is alive, although he's confined to a wheelchair, and we are introduced to two new characters that we had never seen before. The first is Rachel Summers, who is the daughter of Jean Grey and Scott Summers, who is a telepath and a telekinetic. The next person is Franklin Richards, who is the son of Reed Richards and Susan Storm. From this point, we learn that the device that was given to Kitty Pride with regards to completing the jammer goes towards allowing the jammer to uh, disrupt the inhibitor collars that are on the necks of these individual characters and of all mutants who are in internment camps. And what we learn is that these inhibitor collars keep mutants from being able to use their powers. And so they are basically just people. They're not really able to do anything. 
From this point, we also learn that phase one involves uh, Rachel Summers by virtue of being able to use her powers due to the uh, disruption of her inhibitor collar, sending the mind of someone into the past, into their past body, in order to warn the X-Men of the impending event that's going to take place in 1980 that will cause the future to turn out this way. We realize that the person whose mind is going to go into the past is Kitty Pride. From this point, we jump into 1980, and this is the point in which we see Kitty Pride in the past, and at this point, the minds have not switched yet. Kitty Pride is still her younger self, and the older Kitty Pride's mind is presumably traveling into the past at this point. We see that the younger Kitty Pride has stumbled into the danger room of the X-Men, and the X-Men are going through their drills, they're practicing, you know, making sure that they are on par in terms of the use of their powers in addition to their uh, physical capabilities as far as exercise and, and so on and so forth. Um, the minds of Kitty Pride uh, with the future and the Kitty Pride in the past switch and Kitty Pride falls unconscious. Eventually she comes to, and at this point, the mind of Kitty Pride from the future is in the body of Kitty Pride in the past. At this point, she's astonished to see that so many members of the X-Men who have been killed are now alive, Warren Worthington III, Nightcrawler. And so for her, it's really kind of a shock, but she immediately sets in with regards to explaining a set of events that would eventually unfold and lead to the future becoming the way it is in her time. Now, at this point, she tells the X-Men that they must leave and they must head to the summit that Charles Xavier and Maura McTaggart are attending in which Senator Robert Kelly is giving testimony with regards to why the rights of mutants should be restricted. Along the way, she gives us the backstory in terms of what it is that took place. And what we learn is that in 1980, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants assassinated Senator Robert Kelly, Charles Xavier, and Maura McTaggart at the summit that these X-Men are heading to. And what we learn is that in 1984, a crazy, rabid, anti-mutant uh, politician is elected to the position of president. He attempts to pass the Mutant Control Act, however it's shot down by the Supreme Court. So instead, the administration reactivates the Sentinel program, and they give the Sentinels an open-ended directive. And what they say is that the job of the Sentinels is to destroy the mutant threat at all costs. But because of the fact that Sentinels are computers, and computers are creatures of logic, they deduce that the only way to do this is to take over the United States and North America as a whole. And so that is the reason why there is no ordered government in the future. That's the reason why there are no police, there's no standing army, because there is no human government anymore. There are simply just the Sentinels, they rule everything, and all forms of society exist below them. From here... We also learn that when the Sentinels went on a campaign to eradicate uh, mutant kind, they simply didn't just stop there. It wasn't just the mutant threat. It was any kind of super-powered being. And that's the reason why Captain America is killed, why Spider-Man is killed. They are not mutants, but they do have superpowers. And so they were viewed as a threat by Sentinels, and they were eradicated just like everybody else. Now, eventually we jump back into 2013. And what we see is that Kitty Pride is unconscious at this point. The younger mind of Kitty Pride is in her future body, but her mind is in somewhat of a comatose state, and so she's not able to really contribute to what's going on. We also see that Rachel Summers, Colossus, um, uh, Wolverine, um, uh, uh, Franklin Richards, my mind went blank for a second, <laughs> Franklin Richards and everybody else are heading through underground tunnels in order to get to the Baxter Building, which was previously the home of the Fantastic Four, but is now kind of the central nervous system or the central core of the Sentinel operation. What we also learned, and I think we may have actually learned this previously uh, before we switched to 1980, was that the rest of the world had become fearful of the Sentinel campaign in North America. And so the rest of the world had more or less kind of threatened that if the Sentinels had left the United States, if they had left North America and exercised their campaign across the rest of the world, the world would retaliate with nuclear strikes. And as a result, the world itself would fall into a state of uh, total nuclear destruction. Now we realize that this is kind of the timetable that's been provided here. The future group must take some sort of action to stop the Sentinel threat, otherwise the world as a whole will be destroyed.
And so we see them heading towards this Baxter building in an attempt to uh, stop the Sentinel program, but along the way, Franklin Richards is killed. Uh, the group continues to move on, and eventually they make their way to the Baxter building. Now, eventually we pick back up again in 1980 at the summit with Charles Xavier Moore McTaggart and Senator Robert Kelly. At this point, the X-Men are, are there. Storm warns uh, Charles Xavier of the ominous uh, future that Kitty Pride had, uh, had given to them. Uh, Charles Xavier scans the mind of Kitty Pride and verifies this claim and the future that she comes from. At that point, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants breaks in and they begin their campaign of attempting to assassinate Senator Robert Kelly, Charles Xavier, and Maura McTaggart. From this point, this brings an end to uh, X-Men issue number 141, and the story continues in X-Men issue number 142. With the beginning of 142, we again pick up with the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, and over the course of this comic, we see several events taking place. We see the X-Men in the past, in 1980, fighting the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. We also see the X-Men in the future attempting to uh, break into the Baxter building and to destroy the Sentinel program. Uh, Wolverine is killed in the process along with Storm and Colossus, and the only two individuals left are uh, the unconscious Kitty Pride and Rachel Summers. Now, we switch back again to 1980, and the X-Men are successful in defeating the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. The mind of Kitty Pride is eventually teleported back into her future self, and the younger mind of Kitty Pride is teleported back into her younger self. But we don't really know what happens with regards to this future timeline until much later in Marvel Comics in a storyline called the Days of Future Present. However, the 1980 version of the X-Men are left to wonder whether or not this circumstance will actually come to fruition. If the, sen the assassin the assassination of Senator Robert Kelly is inevitable, and they simply postponed it, if the assassination will now never take place, they don't really know what's going to happen, and so the, the question kind of weighs on their minds, what's going to happen next? So the importance of the Days of Future Past comic cannot be overstated, and the reason why is because of the legacy that this comic creates. The legacy that's created by the Days of Future Past is not limited to the concept of just the storyline alone. It also includes future storylines that come about as a result of the success of the Days of Future Past. And one of the biggest reasons is because the Days of Future Past introduced a concept that we hadn't really seen before, and that had been the arbitrary death of comic book characters with no real benefit to their death taking place. And the reason why I say this is because when you look in the past, for example, with Spider-Man, the death of Uncle Ben, as, as it's depicted in Amazing Fantasy number 15, which is actually the first time that we see Spider-Man, is a death that goes towards Peter Parker understanding the kind of respect and the kind of responsibility that comes with him possessing superhuman powers, and he moves from the realm of being this individual that uses his powers for selfishness, to try to get girls, to try to get back at Flash Thompson for bullying him, to becoming a more responsible person as a whole. But that's pretty much the common theme prior to the Days of Future Past. An individual dies, and the death of that individual will lead a team or another individual to become something greater than they already are. In the Days of Future Past, that doesn't happen. The death of all these characters takes place, but we don't, there's really no benefit to it. It's not as though it leads to some greater future, it's not as though it ushers in some greater era of peace or something like that. It's simply that most of the Marvel characters that we know and love die, and this really dark and dystopian future is the result. And because of the popularity of the Days of Future Past, because it was such a huge event and still remains to this day a mainstay among the minds of people who rank popular comic books, it ushered in a darker era in Marvel Comics, and it really allowed Marvel Comics to make a turn, make more of a gritty and darker turn in terms of how they depicted characters, storylines, and groups as a whole in the Marvel Comics universe. And so we see storylines that come later on, the House of M storyline. We see storylines like the Onslaught Saga, where a multitude of comic book characters die in a single event. We see all of these coming to fruition as a result of the popularity that was established by the success of the Days of Future Past comic.
So to a degree, it's kind of up in the air in terms of how the Days of Future Past is going to be depicted in the, the upcoming film that comes out in May of this year. But just by the previews alone, we can see some pretty massive differences. For one, Charles Xavier is alive. And as we established, Charles Xavier was never alive in the Days of Future Past. He was killed before the Days of Future Past comic took place. We see characters like Bishop popping up. And Bishop, what's really interesting about him is that in some of the most common depictions of the Days of Future Past, Bishop is in this storyline. For example, uh, with the Days of Future Past depiction in X-Men the Animated Series, we see Bishop in this timeline. However, the Bishop originates from a timeline that's very similar to the Days of Future Past, but it's not the Days of Future Past itself. Bishop hails from a timeline where a mutant named Hope Summers, who we actually see now in the current uh, X-Men comics, uh, killed one million humans. And as a result, the Sentinel program is reactivated. Uh, Sentinels begin the conquest of the, the same kind of conquest they implemented during the days of future past and virtually all forms of humanity are subjugated below them but what we see in the bishop timeline is an event called the summer's rebellion whereby both humans and mutants make a stand against sentinels and eventually overthrow them although the relationship between humans and mutants still remains strained it's still for the most part a better environment than we see in the days of future past and so we're not exactly sure how things are going to play out i mean wolverine's mind going into the past is kind of a thing that has people irked a little bit, but the one thing you have to bear in mind is that with the Fox version of Marvel films, um, Wolverine has really kind of become the forefront character. He's kind of become the front runner with regards to his popularity among individuals who go to see these films but are not very familiar with comic books. It's the same concept you see in the Marvel Cinematic Universe with regards to Iron Man uh, Tony Stark as he's portrayed by Robert Downey Jr. By no means is Tony Stark the forerunner with regards to Marvel Comics as a whole, not by a long shot. That's a role that could be best given to either Spider-Man or Captain America. However, during the Marvel Cinematic Universe's run up to this point, we really kind of see Tony Stark taking the main stage. He's really kind of the main attraction, and everybody else seems to revolve around him. So, I'm not exactly sure how the depiction of the film is going to be done with regards to Fox, and I won't go as far as to kind of fan the flames of the debate taking place between between which movies are better, the Marvel Cinematic Universe or the movies produced by Fox. But what I will say is that I think that Fox and Brian Singer are going to be able to produce a film that's reasonable enough to where it can give good credit to the Days of Future Past storyline, despite the fact that there are some differences between the uh, cinematic version and the version that's presented to us in the comic books. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, let me know, and I will catch you guys later. Peace! And like Captain America, Bucky Barnes is a creation of Joe Simon and Jack Kirby and is designed to be a propaganda piece. But where Captain America is a propaganda piece that's really geared towards adults, Bucky Barnes is geared towards children and is designed to spur support for World War II among children who in turn will influence their parents.